Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, that sort of ridiculous woman who just rambles on and on, and I am back again with exactly that. So I had originally planned that only Tuesday's episode was going to be a Q&A, but then I only answered like a handful and it was over an hour, and I have so many more great questions that I think you all are going to really appreciate Plus, well, I had thought about a conversation episode for this week, but with my Atlantis series coming up next week, I didn't want to lose a particularly important and interesting conversation in all of the hype around that. And so today, back again, answering more of your questions, because honestly, they're really good. You all asked a lot of questions that I think are beneficial all around. Some questions about studying classics, what that's like, but also what you can do after it, which I sort of half mostly jokingly answered in the last Q&A, but I want to get into a bit more now. Um, More questions about translations, about history, about just interesting things that I have never thought of covering or answering, and I think a lot of you are going to really appreciate the answers. And so I thought, why the hell not another Q&A episode to really get through some of these really fascinating questions that have like really important and wide-reaching answers that I think it's just really beneficial. And without the questions, I never think to cover these things. So that's why these episodes work so well. (laughs) Anyway... I hope you all are enjoying these Q&As. I really think they're important. Again, like I do try to not do them all that often, but when I do, we get these really great questions. So it turns into something very wonderful. Studying the ancient world, finding the best translation, and how good was Odysseus anyway? A New Year Q&A Part 2. So again, I'm going to try to categorize these questions so that they can be referred to after if anyone's looking for answers to particular questions. And we'll start with what I started with in the introduction, questions about studying classics and what's that like. And just, I think a lot of you are really curious about that. And as somebody who, you know, did their degree like 10 years ago and is somehow now using it, I think it's really helpful, especially if you're younger, if you're thinking about universities, to have these answers or insights, I guess, from somebody who's done it and then also found a really bizarre way of finding success in this field and sort of proves that there are some options. So Ty asked, I don't know if this is the kind of question you're looking for, but I'm genuinely interested in classic studies. Could you maybe explain briefly what you do in that career and where you can work in professional settings afterwards? So this is a good question. And like I like I said, I kind of like half laughingly answered it in the last episode. And that's simply because like, I don't feel like I have a great answer about the different places you can work that are really specific to classics. Like I've obviously found myself in a really bizarre scenario that I never really expected. Um, so I'm kind of a weird like exception to the rule. But that said, I did my classics degree for fun. You know, so I did a double major. I did an English literature degree and classics. And I had every intention of working in publishing with that English degree and the classics was just because I loved it and I really wanted to learn it. And so for me, I think what worked out really well was that I did that because I just wanted to. And then once I found that, you know, publishing wasn't my thing, I ended up inadvertently shifting into classics by starting this podcast. And I think it's a really good example of like, I think when you're young, you think you have to know what you're going to do. You have to know what you're going to use your degree for. You have to have a goal. And that is super limiting and often, I think, just gets you stuck in something that maybe you're not actually happy in. 
So for instance, quick like life story, I didn't go to university until I was 21. I was working like a career style job at the time, but I wrote a book on a whim in my free time and then looked into getting that published and blah, blah, blah. I think I mentioned this. I'm not going to repeat it all. But basically, it led me to want to go into publishing, which then led me to get my degree and then the classics degree for fun. And then afterwards, I did work in publishing and it was not great. You know, there was lots of great things about it. I miss it sometimes. I'm not shitting on publishing entirely, but it is an industry that has a lot of issues and it's really hard to move up and it's really hard to make any money. And it's just, you know, there's a lot of flaws, but publishing books is super important and cool. And obviously, you know, no shade on that. But the way it worked for me is I kind of had like a quarter life crisis. Like I had to quit publishing because I wasn't making enough money and I moved home for some various reasons and, or rather to my home province. And I got in with a job that I hated even more and it was freaking awful. And then I started the podcast because I was lonely and bored and needed something to do. And then it grew into what it is now, you know? So I think it's just a good example of like, you can have all these goals, you can try all these goals and maybe your goals are going to work and they're going to end up being exactly what you want them to be. And you're going to be super happy for however long, or maybe your goals aren't what you want them to be. Maybe you end up having different goals or like developing goals based on your life experience that comes later. So like I'm 33 and I've just now, you know, this with this podcast, I feel like I've like reached a thing like like something tangible, I am successful in whatever way. And that and that didn't come until I had already like, quote unquote, failed at a couple of other things and was in my 30s, you know, so I just think, don't put so much pressure on yourself, I guess, if you don't fully know, or take some things you're passionate about, get a degree in something you're passionate about and figure it out later. Obviously, that's easier said than done. Like there's so many limitations. I have insane student loans. I'm not, you know, I'm not the type of person whose parents paid for their university or anything. So I'm not talking from that point of view. But you know, if you can handle it, if you can make it work, like, just do something you love. And then kind of you can often figure out a way afterwards, you know, knowledge is helpful, regardless of how you end up using it. It's a beneficial thing. If you find that you fit in academia, academia is also not for everyone. You can also learn so much without that structure without this like strictness of of academia so there's just so many options do what you love and try to make that work and if you can it's really rewarding casey asked another question basically about that um a Currently in the process of applying for universities, they said, my heart is constantly telling me to apply for a classics program, but I'm not 100% sure. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your university experience studying classics. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, it's so similar to what I was just saying, basically, but I suppose that's more of a career aspect, um, which I realize now I didn't answer about specific careers. I just don't really know other than like academia, you know, because I think it's about figuring out a career around what you want to study versus having a career in mind, because that can often fail you like it did me with publishing. Um, But when it comes to actually studying classics, I, like I said, didn't go until I was 21, which I think made a big difference because I was able to take it a bit more seriously, I guess, because I'd kind of figured myself out a little bit more. Obviously not, you know, now I look back and I'm like, man, you had no idea who you were. But at the same time, it's a little bit more than in high school and there's a little less pressure to do certain things or succeed in a certain way. So I just sort of, I don't know, I I ended up just, I started as a minor and then I looked at the course list and realized that every elective I was going to take was going to be classics anyway, because there were so many cool classes I wanted to take. And so I just did a double major. That said, I went to university at Concordia in Montreal, and they had a somewhat limited, it was a good classics program, but it was somewhat limited. These days, I think a lot of university departments are trying to broaden their departments so that they are not, you know, quote unquote classics, just ancient Greece and Rome, but more so the, you know, ancient history of the Mediterranean more broadly, because all of these cultures should be studied as much as ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but those have been favored, you know, for so long. So I would have loved to be able to get a degree where it was more broad and studied, you know, more of the ancient Mediterranean. We touched on, like I had a class that had, you know, mythologies from everywhere, but it was one class. And then I had a class in Egyptian archeology, span but there was, again, only like one class available and it was kind of almost an experimental class, which was great. But like, it would have been really nice if there was more available, like 
Mesopotamia and and the cultures that came after it, you know, more of the ancient Mediterranean. There are so many cultures between Mesopotamia and the Persia after and, you know, the Hittites and Egypt and Carthage, all of these different places, the Phoenicians, all of these different cultures that we don't tend to study unless you're in a specific program that's already kind of broadened its breadth, I suppose. Anyway, so I I would suggest if you're going to study the ancient Mediterranean that you study all of it, not just ancient Greece and Rome, because they really all worked together to make the Mediterranean what it was. And, you know, without one, we wouldn't have any of them. So I think if you can study all of it, I would really highly recommend that. That said, I mean, I enjoy all of it. I enjoyed the history classes and the mythology classes. I enjoyed all the archaeology classes. I didn't take languages. I wish I had. I would recommend taking languages as well. I also think it's important to realize that like academia isn't for everyone or sometimes it's for you, but not quite in the way that it is for other people. For instance, my worst grades in my whole classics degree were in mythology and not because I didn't love it or learn in those classes or develop all these you know, this impressive knowledge, but just because the way my brain wanted to study mythology wasn't the way that the professor wanted to mark mythology. And she loved me. We used to have conversations in class all the time, but when it came down to like what was expected of the class, it just wasn't what my brain wanted to give. And so it's just such a really interesting thing. And I think you need to keep that in mind. Academia isn't for everyone. That doesn't mean you don't necessarily get a degree. Like, I got a degree, thrilled I got a degree. I'm also thrilled I didn't keep going. And I'm thrilled I didn't take it as seriously as I think sometimes you're you're led to believe it is. You know, it doesn't really matter what your grades are if you're only getting a BA and then you're going to leave with just your BA. Like nobody asks you what your grades are. I got with distinction. What does that mean now? It means literally nothing because I didn't do anything with it afterwards and that's fine. All right, let's dive into some more fun and exciting topics. Let's go back to some mythology specific. Lauren asked, what are your opinions on Hera portrayed as a villain, both in modern media and ancient mythology? So Hera is so fascinating. You know, I was thrilled to be able to cover her in more detail this past year in, and just sort of look at her from beyond this idea of her just like as the wife who punishes all of the women who Zeus had sex with. Because it is, it's so unfortunate and Hera was supremely important and lovely and Hera is a fascinating figure. I really don't love when she's portrayed as a villain in modern interpretations because it seems so tired. It seems so overdone. Like, why? To me, it's just like, why would you do that? There are so many better ways to make a villain from Greek mythology that is not, you know, demonizing a woman because a man was shitty, right? Like, it just, it's so unnecessary. It's overdone. It's based in this patriarchal view that is, it's not, you know, vital to the mythology. You can make Hera a strong character who, you know, punishes Zeus maybe, or just gives no fucks about it. Like there's no harm in that. Now, when it comes to ancient portrayals, it's a little bit different because that was kind of the whole thing. That said, Hera was important beyond her role, you know, as like wife and punisher. She was the goddess of marriage of all things, but also families and childbirth in certain ways and, you know, this important stuff. And so I don't know, I guess the my answer, I can't really judge how she's portrayed back then, but I can look at it with a critical eye like I like to do and, you know, examine why that would be and what might have existed about her beyond that. I'm sure women had a lot of stories to tell about Hera. I'm sure they thought a lot of things about her that had absolutely no relation to Zeus or certainly no relation to her desire to punish all the women who were associated with him. You know, all of that comes from the place where the people who were telling it that it got written down, not necessarily all the people that were telling these stories. It's just the matter of what got written down, right? So, but when it comes to modern, it really, it's tired. It's unnecessary. We need to stop making Hera the villain. Like, there's so many actual villains, you know, that why Hera? It's, ugh, yeah, 
No. Now, San asked, why have the same gods in Greek and Roman myth? How did the same god influence a race of people that are quite starkly different? So I found this question really interesting, and I think it's something that I don't talk about enough because it doesn't come up all that naturally on my podcast since I do tend to focus on Greek or specifically if I'm going into Rome, I'm going into Ovid, who wrote Greek myths, basically, but with the Roman names. But Ovid was working off the Greek tradition in a way that not all of Roman mythology was. So I'm sure I've said this in the past, and I've definitely reevaluated my views, but a common misconception about Roman mythology is that they copied it from the Greeks, or they took it from the Greeks, or they borrowed it, what have you, whatever these terms, you know, it's not really the case. It's just that it looks like that because the Greeks came earlier and, you know, the Romans have a lot of the same gods. But the Greeks had a lot of the same gods as, you know, say, the people in the East, uh, you know, certain gods in Phoenicia, the Hittites, the Egyptians. It's just that they don't resemble them quite so specifically because of the regional differences. But you can... You can and they did, you know, collect, connect a lot of their gods with other gods of the general Mesopotamian region, region. You know, like Aphrodite, I think it's it's Astarte, who is, I believe, Phoenician. They are very similar. Isis has roots, or rather Io has roots in Isis. There's a lot of connection between these Mediterranean people. You know, it's all comes back to what I just said, you know, about studying the ancient Mediterranean. They really all were this like sort of, it's just this region that they were so much in contact with one another, either, you know, for trade or travel or war, that they were just so influenced by one another that they really all work in this kind of like perfect harmony of this ancient world. And that is true for the gods as well. It's just that with the Roman, the Roman were a bit more influenced by the Greek. You know, the Greeks were really prevalent in the region, especially Sicily. And so they just had more contact. And so it's a bit more obvious how similar the gods are between the Greeks and the Romans. And, you know, and then same with the stories, like the Romans, the Romans just paid attention to the Greeks and then they eventually conquered Greece too, right? So then they had everything coming from that aspect. And so they ended up having a lot of similar stories or the same stories or interconnected stories. Obviously, the Aeneid is a great example. You know, the, the Aeneid is so interconnected with the Iliad, not because it was stolen or borrowed, but because everyone was influenced by everyone else and Rome came after. And so they just found this way of incorporating themselves into the history of the region through the mythology of the Aeneid. So in... I mean, I suppose this is not necessarily answering the question of how different the two groups were, which they were, but not, you know, not in any kind of like really stark way. They were different because they were from different time periods. They have different priorities. You know, Rome was a bit more war obsessed. Uh, that that could be wrong. The history is not 100%, you know, in my brain, but from what I take of, of these two people. But also Rome just came later. They had different priorities. They were in a different region. They just, everything was just slightly different, you know, but they weren't that different of a people, truly, ultimately. You know, they're all ancient people of this ancient Mediterranean. They have so many things in common. It, it, they just seem different in certain ways, but ultimately they weren't. And the gods, you know, Rome had their own gods too. They had their own mythology, totally separate from Greek influence. They, you know, prioritized different gods than the Greeks did. It really is quite different. It's just that I suppose what it all comes down to for why we see them as so similar or we see them as the same gods is a lot to do with the fact that Latin, so this is going to be hard for me to explain. And again, it's just based on my various knowledge that I've gleaned, but Latin was the more dominant language, right? Because Rome came after and then Latin led into Christianity. So it became super dominant. So Greek text were translated into Latin and then thus had the Latin names for the gods. And then those Latin texts were often the ones that were translated into English when English came along. And so they kept the Roman names. So it's not like the Roman names, you know, it's not like the Romans just had exactly the same stories. It's just that often we have the Roman names for the gods of the Greeks because of Latin, not because 
of Rome necessarily or because the gods were the same or any of that. It's just because Latin became bigger. And so, you know, Odysseus ends up Ulysses in a bunch of English texts, not because the Greeks would have ever called him Ulysses or because Ulysses was particularly important in Rome. As far as I know, he was not. It's just a matter of the Latin that came in between that then gave us these Roman names, you know, Jupiter and Juno and all these different people. And that wasn't necessarily because the Romans just like took all the gods from the Greeks or stole them all from the Greeks. It's simply a matter of like the Latin in between. That has got to be like a super, super, you know, brief and simplified explanation that again, is just from various things I've paid attention to. But I think it's a sort of an easy way to wrap your head around it. It's not that it was all the same. Romans had very different gods. They had some of their own gods. They had very different priorities. It's just a matter of how those things have been conflated if you're not living in that world of study. It just seems like they had the same gods or stolen gods or borrowed gods or whatever. I hope that helped. I think it's really interesting, but I also just kind of can talk in circles in my brain. Speaking of Hera, Sersha asked, So I read somewhere that Zeus had other wives before Hera. Is this widely accepted? Because I've never heard of it before. Also, how would that work? Was divorcing your partner a concept in ancient Greece? So, I don't know enough about, you know, whether divorce of some kind was a thing with you know, real ancient Greek people. But when it comes to Zeus's quote unquote other wives, this is really a matter of translation, but also like, I think, interpretation. So Zeus was with a lot of women. And I think when it comes to women that then gave birth to important gods, like say, Leto, for example, right? Leto is the mother of Apollo and Artemis, and she's often called Zeus's wife. And to me, what that simply means is that the, either the translation or the interpretation is legitimizing Leto and Zeus's relationship in order to legitimize Artemis and Apollo. Now, I don't know if that is an ancient construct, whether they felt like they needed to be married in order to be legitimate, or if that's like more of an interpretation from our time, you know, from the more modern idea of marriage and fidelity and all of that. Obviously, Hera's jealousy suggests that fidelity was a thing back then. But when it comes to these wives, I think it's more so a matter of really just like trying to understand it or, yeah, legitimize or make Zeus seem good. There's not really like a timeline. So we don't really have like a before Hera, right? Because there's a, like, I mean, this is something I try to explain every time, but there really isn't any kind of understanding of timeline beyond, you know, the Titans came first, and then the second generation of Titans, and then Zeus. And so there's not really like an in-between of like, after Zeus, you know, took hold, but before he married Hera, and who did he, who, what, when, where, there really isn't a timeline. It's just sort of different stories of different things happening and just different reference points. So it's sort of unnecessary to try to think in terms of divorce or when he married who or who he actually married. The point is, you know, Hera is accepted as his wife during basically all of the real stories. But there are these other women like Leto, and I'm sure there are more, I just can't think of off the top of my head, where they're called his wife. But I really think that's more about interpretation understanding, just legitimizing, considering these things versus any kind of like timeline of like an actual divorce. There was no, you know, him splitting up with somebody. There's no story about that. It's just a matter of who is the mother and of who, why does it matter? Should they have been married? You know, things like that. It's, it, it all ultimately comes down to the same old thing, which is that like, there's no chronology. Everything was written or told over stories, you know, orally over hundreds of years before it was written down and in different regions and different time periods. And so there's just no like linking it all up together. And then continuing on with Irish names, this one I had to look up, so I hope I pronounced it right. But Keelan asked, why is it the Oracle? Is there only one? I always thought there were loads, like one for each town or area. So this is a good question and an interesting one. I say the oracle because it tends to be in mythology. It, you're, if you say the oracle, you're referring to the oracle of Delphi. The oracle of Delphi was by far the most important 
ancient oracle and oracle of mythology. But you're right, there were more than one oracle. There were not, however, like loads or each town or anything. They might have have, have had different um, like seers, uh, you know, sort of prophets prophetizing in certain areas. You have people like Tiresias, right, who kind of bounces around to a bunch of different stories and locales, though primarily Thebes. Um, and, you know, he would give prophecies, but he was not an oracle. So there's a big difference there. There was a lot of people who would give prophecies, who could see the future and tell of what was going to happen, but they were not oracles. Oracles were like a set tradition. They were women who were trained, who were like uh, taken in by these priests. The priests would interpret what they had to say. They would speak in kind of like, like almost jumbles, I think, or sometimes they think, you know, there was sort of some sort of like fume or drug going on and then the priests would interpret it. So you would actually hear your oracle, your like prophecy from the priest. You wouldn't actually hear it from the Pythia, who's like the woman, the oracle. You would hear it from the priest who got to do the interpreting. Thus, you know, adding another man's hand in the scenario, even though it was the woman who got to be the Pythia. But the oracle of Delphi is the most important one. There were a few others. The other major one was the oracle at Dodona, which is the one that was associated with Zeus rather than Apollo, which is interesting. I think there were a few others, but they were still Still, like major ideas and even still the primary one was always the oracle of delphi always like that's the big one that's the real one you go to if you really need your info the oracle at dodona too like operated in a different way there's some kind of more so it was about i think like uh, seeing things like me i i'm not going to describe it right but it was it was different i'm going to look into dodona sometime because i think it's quite fascinating the differences but ultimately if you say the oracle you are talking about the oracle of delphi the primary oracle but again there were prophecies going on left right and center in the mythology but they were not the oracle Shifting gears, Theo says, I just wanted to know your thoughts a little more on Odysseus, other than the fact that he's your main man. His sexcapades on the way back to Ithaca are just what stands out to me most. And I want information on why he's so cool, kind of specific, but he's just been on, but kind of specific, but it's just been on my mind. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Okay. So Odysseus, I mean, yeah, he's like, He's my main man. He is really shitty, though. I feel like I never said that enough during the Odyssey, but he was really shitty. He did a lot of uh, garbage things. He let all of his men die. He killed a lot of people. He was with a lot of women. Probably not all of it was consensual, though it's a little bit less explicit when it comes to him. And he, in one version of a story, he threw a baby off a tower at the at the, after the fall of Troy. He threw Hector and Andromache's baby Astyanax off a tower to its death. But that's in one version. Anyway, Odysseus was just a fascinating guy. For me, what I find so interesting and why I like to call him my main man is just, I suppose it's the Odyssey itself. I'm really interested in the Odyssey. My interest has really changed and grown over the years of this podcast, like all of my knowledge and interest in mythology has. Now, you know, I find it fascinating his story is so incredible in the Odyssey, but was pointed out to me too that like, we're just supposed to take his word on it. Like all that we have of the wild wanderings of Odysseus are all through his own words. They're not through the narrator, like they're through him telling the story. And so it's kind of like, what do we believe? How much are we to believe? How much of it is showing off? We know he's a good liar, right? Because when we do have narrative points of view we have him lying his ass off you know he tells this epic long story to the swineherd when he gets back to Ithaca he tells this incredibly long and convoluted story about how he's this random guy from Crete and here's his whole life history and it's all a lie and that's just one of the many times that he lies through his teeth so it's like are we then to suggest that or to believe that the odyssey itself all of his story is a lie or was he suddenly telling the truth then or what have you and then you know i just find his whole his whole shtick incredibly interesting and weird and i don't know i, I don't have a great reason i just think there's just so much there and i think like i said a huge part of it is just that we have the odyssey because there's just so little 
we have that's like the Odyssey. Like, it, you know, the Iliad is even completely different. The Iliad is about, it's about Achilles' rage, but it's also about, like, all the other things happening in the Trojan War. But the Odyssey is about Odysseus. And so it's just a matter of we have so much more. And so I immediately am drawn to it, I think, just because of the sheer amount of story and content and questions and... It's just generally so fascinating and it all kind of revolves around him and therefore he became my main man. But he was also one of the first people that I was ever really introduced to. Like in elementary school, we watched that mini series, you know, on the TV, rolled in with the VCR, taped from TV. <laughs> We're pretty sure we had to fast forward through the commercials. It's a whole thing, very 90s. But we watched this Odysseus mini series, and I think that just kind of really drew me in. And then I read the Odyssey and loved it to pieces. And so it just is more of like a historical thing for me why I love him. But ultimately, like he's kind of, I mean, he's a really shitty guy. His his way of coming home to Ithaca and punishing the suitors who like weren't great sure but he murders all of them like that part's unnecessary they don't need to die like that's him just fucking with Zinnia completely like it's just it's it's generally fascinating the whole thing in the story what we believe what we don't how he is you know our version of a hero our understanding of hero is based on a modern understanding not an ancient one so you know who knows what that means in terms of his his heroism but he just does so much shit. He's a really dark dude, but it's so fascinating and his lies are so fascinating. You know, wily, cunning Odysseus and all of his madness. I also just love Sean Bean and Troy, so that helped too. And that leads directly into this next question from Dave, who says, One of the most wonderful things about mythology is the way different people connect to it in different ways. I know you have extremely strong feelings about Theseus, but do you think negatively about people who like him? Similar to how you admit Odysseus was flawed, but he's your main man. So this has a couple different answers, and I think it's a really interesting question, and one that, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I have my biases. Everyone does in everything. But in Greek mythology, it's so easy, too, because you you take different things out of it depending on how you're reading it and who you are as a person and your priorities and, and what have you. So, yeah, Odysseus is like shit, but I love him for all of those things, I, all those reasons I just said, you know, whereas Theseus for me is completely irredeemable because of everything he's done. But the, you know, the question of do I judge people who or have strong feelings about them who like Theseus, I would say it depends on their reasoning. You know, if somebody's going to come in and tell me that Theseus is great because he treated women so well and he never did anything wrong and what a nice guy, or if they're going to come at me with, like a lot of people tend to tell me I'm wrong about Theseus, I'm putting that in air quotes, wrong. Because, you know, oh, he, it was the gods who made him leave Ariadne on an island, and it was his grief over Ariadne that made him not change the sails, and blah, 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 right? And those are not invalid readings of Theseus, but they are not also the only valid readings of Theseus. My readings of him are also not wrong, because objectively, you can read these things, like, there are, there's a version where he you know, who was forced to forget Ariadne, sure. But there's also a version where he just left her there. And that's the thing about these variations and everything, right, is we all can view these things in our own way because there are often so many different variations. Now, that doesn't apply to the Odyssey, right? The Odyssey is the Odyssey. That is all we have. That is all we know. And so it's a lot easier to interpret it directly from this one text source versus Theseus, who has these stories from many hundreds of years, you know, all the way up to Plutarch, who's writing during the Roman period. Like, there's a huge swath of time for all these variations. And, you know, you can see Theseus as a good person. That said, like, a lot of people will say that, and then they will you know, I guess sort of gloss over all the objectively bad things he did, which is that he, like, assaulted and kidnapped a lot of women, including a girl that was at best 12 with Helen of Troy. So, you know, Helen of Sparta, gosh, I can't believe I called her Helen of Troy. Whew. But yeah, so I think Theseus is different for me for those reasons. Like, I don't want to hear someone telling me it's okay that he kidnapped a 12 year old for whatever reason they might have in their head or, you know, that the same thing he, he also, you know, kidnapped uh, the leader of the Amazons. There's the Ariadne thing. There's a few things that you can talk around and you can see how they're not necessarily bad. 
Ariadne, the sails, the Minotaur, you know, even the all the people he killed on his way to Athens, you know, if they really were bandits, sure, you know, then if they were really doing those things, they deserve to die. I'm not going to deny that. But there are things that Theseus did that should not be excused. Helen uh, being abducted being the number one, because it occurs in almost every story of his. Her age varies, but as far as I know, at absolute best, she's 12. So it's like, I mean, uh, uh, uh. so yeah, it would really depend for me on on what a person's reasoning is. If they're going to tell me that the the worst thing he did is Helen, and that is objectively bad, but everything else makes up for it, that's their own opinion. You know, I'm not going to judge that. But if they're going to tell me that abducting Helen at 12 wasn't bad for X reason, I'm going to get the hell out of there because I think that's a big old red flag, you know? (laughs) I think that's the perfect segue into a question from Andrea, who says, which Greek myth would you want to be retold or wouldn't mind to be retold from a male's perspective? Like from the perspective of a man who wasn't necessarily the main hero of the story, like what Miller did for Patroclus in the Iliad. So, I think that is a really good question and also a way for me to remind everyone that I don't hate men. I just hate men who assault women and I don't know why that is so controversial to some people. Not most of you, obviously, that's why you're listening. But for real, the number of times people equate me talking shit about men who do very, very, very objectively bad things. They say that's the same thing as me just hating all men. It's truly wild. But uh, there's a lot of men that I would find I would have uh, I would really want stories out of I mean obviously I'm writing a story of Cadmus so he is my number one man but also Diomedes in the Iliad I think his would be fascinating same with Philoctetes right who like gets abandoned on an island because he gets a snake bite and then they have to come back and get him they're like oh turns out we really needed you please come back to the war like I mean obviously there is a play called Philoctetes but a novel about Philoctetes or Diomedes or even Ajax or, oh God, any of the men from the Trojan side, like Hector. Oh my God, be still my beating heart. Let's read a novel about Hector and Andromache. Even Paris, you know, because he's complex and also chitty and it would be kind of entertaining. Or maybe Paris is just in Hector's novel, like just being on the sidelines, being kind of shitty, but Hector's there being the king of kings, you know. There's a lot of really interesting men, specifically in the Iliad, who I would love to have stories about. The mythology beyond the Iliad kind of gets a little wishy-washy, right? Because then we have all the variations and we have different intentions with the mythology behind the the Iliad, or behind the world of of Greek myth. Um in terms of gen- general myths, Bellerophon Bellerophon is so often left out. I think he would be really interesting. He's a very flawed character, but also a fascinating one. Even Perseus, an accurate, you know, retelling of Perseus, looking at some complexities, something like that could be interesting as well. There are so many options. The men from Greek myth are super fascinating and interesting. And I simply don't like the ones that assault women or, you know, do objectively other objectively bad things but ultimately like gods I love so many of them because I just love all of it you know just it's also damn fascinating but I do want to know more about Diomedes and and Philoctetes for sure they would be sort of maybe my number ones just generally it's fascinating I mean I'm gonna finish this thing about Cadmus one day I swear And to finish off the mythology style questions, a Medusa question, because of course a Medusa question, from Adele. I heard a story recently where Medusa lives with her sisters in an island at the edge of the night after Athena cursed her and before Perseus got to her. Her and her sister were like helping each other cope and stuff. I can't find a source to back it up. Have you heard it before? What's the source? So this is a bit of a combination of sources, actually. So essentially... Medusa did live at the edge of night. That is in basically all of the sourcing, as far as I understand. Edge of the world, edge of night. It's the same general location. She lived at the edge, around where the Hesperides were. So that's sort of the furthest western edge of the world, as far as the mythology understood it. So that is always where Medusa has lived with her Gorgon sisters, Theno and Euryale. 
That's the story. Now, when it comes to the Athena curse, that is pretty explicitly in Ovid in terms of surviving sources, right? As far as I know, the Ovid version is the only one where Athena explicitly curses Medusa. But the living at the edge of night is all the time. So essentially, this is just conflating a couple of different things. It's primarily coming from Ovid, because Ovid has the curse of Athena on Medusa and her, you know, existing there at the edge of the world before Perseus comes. Perseus always finds her at the edge of the world. That's the thing. That's the story. So really, yeah, this is, it, it's definitely sourced. It's just kind of putting together a few different things. But again, primarily working off the Ovid tradition where there is a curse of Athena. Now, I stand by, and so I'll just remind you all this now, you know, people like to talk about what is Ovid, what is not, whether that makes it valid or invalid. There's always a lot of angry dudes on the internet ready to point out that it's only Ovid that says Medusa was assaulted by Poseidon, that Athena cursed her, blah, blah, blah. Now, it's true, the Athena curse is, as far as I understand it, explicitly in Ovid in terms of surviving sources. I say in terms of surviving sources because we don't know what Ovid was working off of. He could have had a more ancient source that said this, that he was then working off of, but that we don't have. That is very possible. That being said, that Medusa was assaulted by Poseidon, was a survivor of Poseidon, is pretty broadly in the mythology from the very beginning. Because in Hesiod, Hesiod is the oldest surviving source that names Medusa, and he explicitly says that Poseidon lay with her in a field of flowers, and that then she suffered a woeful fate. Now, the woeful fate could refer to Perseus, but it could also refer to Poseidon, and the lay with is a translation, but not always an accurate one. There, it's it's really open to interpretation, but also, based on the ancient Greek and people I've spoken to, it's very realistic to understand that Hesiod source as talking about an assault by Poseidon. Hesiod never went into consent because it was like not a concern in that work at all. And so it wouldn't have ever been explicit. But uh, according to people who know ancient Greek and who have spoken to me, it is pretty reasonable to translate the term used. It could be consensual or otherwise. And given it is immediately followed with suffered a woeful fate, it's not impossible to connect that. You could be Perseus, could be Poseidon, could be both. So it's really interesting. I stand by that uh, Medusa as a survivor of Poseidon comes from the original, rather not the original, but the oldest surviving sources. Uh, But the Athena curse is Ovid. I like to kind of take it out just because I don't think we need to demonize Athena. Obviously, this is like in direct contradiction to what I've said in the past. But again, I am constantly growing and evolving in this podcast. And so are my opinions. So for me, I stand by that absolutely when it comes to the oldest sourcing on Medusa being a survivor of Poseidon. I think it makes her sympathetic, but also strong. It also lends itself to the idea that Perseus was really just going there I mean, it was literally all just because, you know, Polydectes wanted Perseus killed, right? He he wanted him to die so that he could be with Perseus's mother. And he sent Perseus on a quest that he thought was going to kill him, the, defeating a Gorgon. It wasn't because a Gorgon was causing any trouble, that Medusa was causing any grief at all or doing anything wrong. He had to find her at the edge of the world, at the edge of night. All right, diving back into some questions that are a bit more about me and my thoughts, but also helpful for others. The question from Katie, who says, hey, what advice would you give about being a woman traveling alone? I would love a trip to Greece or Italy, but as a 20-something female, I'm nervous about going abroad myself. Okay, so I think this is an important question and one that I have learned the answer to over time. I first traveled vaguely alone um, when I was 20. I went to Rome 
uh, and a couple other places with a good friend of mine who was like 19. So, you know, we weren't completely alone, but we were two young women traveling. And this was God's 13 years ago. Whew. Um, we had such a good time, never felt really unsafe, particularly. That said, I was nervous and I was kind of, you know, I, I got homesick and I, was, I didn't have the best time being there alone. But then I went back when I was 30. That's the time that I went fully alone to Athens and I've never loved anything more. I'm a person who loves to be alone. I really love to live alone, to be in my own thoughts. I appreciate that. So I think that's an important aspect. But I traveled to Athens alone. I was there for 10 days. I got rained out, so I only ended up really being in Athens, but it was perfect. Athens is lovely. There are obviously like any place, any big city, there are sketchier neighborhoods and there are, you know, safer neighborhoods. That's true of anywhere. But Athens, you know, if you're staying in the touristy areas, which I would recommend for your first trip, um, it's, it's really so safe. Greece, everyone is so nice. I encountered a grand total of one person who was a jerk on my whole trip last time. I was there for a month and I traveled to a bunch of different places and truly like... Everyone is so nice. If if you speak English and not Greek, the English is everywhere. I would recommend learning some Greek terms. The language is gorgeous and they really appreciate it because most people don't learn any Greek and because their alphabet is different, it, it's often harder and they'll spell it out for you in a lot of places, but you know, it, you can totally get by with English, but I would recommend it. Greek is beautiful and please and thank you are easy to learn. Please, parakalo. It also means you're welcome. And thank you is Afkaristo. And it is just lovely. And so I would recommend it. Duolingo is free. Learn a few phrases. They'll really love you. And it's fun and a beautiful language. But honestly, I felt really safe. I think it depends on how you are. After, you know, when I went when I was 20, I had never left my home city, you know, without family. But afterwards, I moved away across the country alone. And so by the time I went when I was 30, you know, I had moved to Montreal alone and then I had moved to Toronto alone and then I had moved to Vancouver alone. So I had done a lot of things and maybe that helped, maybe it didn't. But honestly, Greece is nice. It's safe and it's lovely and the people are very kind. And so I, I wouldn't, I couldn't recommend it more. It's been a while since I've been to Italy, but I also only remember good things through that. But I can certainly speak more to Greece just because I've done that twice alone recently. Now, left turn back into my favorite thing. Brooke asks, have you considered getting a Twitch account and playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey so we can watch you play the story and you can talk about the history and myths in the game? We can then watch and geek out live with you. <laughs> I started playing the game because of your podcast and love when you come out with episodes where you geek out on the game because I have no one else to geek out on it with. I identify with this deeply. I really love this game so much. Obviously didn't say that enough on this last Q&A episode. Gosh. Anyway, um, I have definitely considered it. It is a huge part because I don't understand technology. Um, but I'm con I, I would consider learning how to set up a Twitch account and figure that out. It just feels daunting trying to learn how to do it. Um, but I really should because I would love to share it with everyone because it really is so nerdy and I've played it so much. And I think that I could have a lot of fun uh, playing it and explaining things to you guys and just like dorking out over that stuff. So I'm, I'm certainly going to be looking into it. It's a matter of I barely find the time to keep up with everything else. So tends to be that when I'm playing Odyssey, it's because I've just spent 10 hours nonstop doing things for the podcast and then I shut down by playing Odyssey. So do I want to stay on and like, you know, paying attention? Maybe not, but there's going to be a time and place for it. I just got to figure out how to set it up. But obviously we're going to stay on the Assassin's Creed Odyssey questions because Atheris asks, what's your favorite Easter egg slash Greek myth reference in AC Odyssey? It can be a quest or a location or a statue. So off the top of my head, I was thinking about this because I want to come up with like a great idea, but I didn't have a great example. But from the very top of my head, one of the things I found that was like full, I would say the best definition of an Easter egg, because there really is so many incredible things in this game, so much mythological, you know, knowledge and history and oh my gosh, totally incredible. But I think the best straight up 
Easter egg is this one quest line in Fokis where you are helping the guy named Lycaon. His, I think it's his mother was an oracle or it was his grandmother, whatever. You know, they're mad about, you know, in, in AC Odyssey, the oracle is controlled by the cult of cosmos and all this. That's all the fictionalized stuff. But it's, you're helping this guy do a bunch of things. And before you get to the, like, the mother bit, so his name's Lycaon. And then you're helping him with all of these things that have these like vague reference points to werewolves. If you know what you're looking for, there's, there's wolves, there's weird comments made by him and the townspeople about like a mystery. There's something I think to do with the full moon. There's a lot of like really subtle werewolf hints. And then his name is Lycaon, right? Which is the first greek myth we have with reference which references what can be pretty explicitly termed a werewolf now it doesn't follow up there is no follow-up in the quest line that suggests that he is that like aeon or that there's a werewolf but there's just these little comments throughout so i was playing it like oh my god there's a werewolf there's a werewolf and then you know there wasn't but they really knew what they were doing just in terms of like the little little hints they have between his his comments and then the townspeople that are in relation to him. It's really cute and fun and just like this tiny little dorky reference that you would absolutely not notice it unless you know the myth of the werewolf and the name Lycaon. It's fun. Another shift into more historical questions because I've got a couple of really interesting ones from you guys there. Uh, Midhat asks... Or says, rather, I've been re-listening to all your Greek tragedy episodes and it got me thinking. Do you know if there was such a thing as actor celebrity worship culture when it came to the plays and tragedies? Like, were there certain actors who were very well known, liked, talented, and plays got more hype by casting said person in a main role? This is a great question. I wish I had a more concrete answer. It's now going to be a goal of mine to find somebody to talk more about Greek tragedy in that way, like the more, like less about the tragedies themselves and more about the culture that surrounded it, because it really was huge. But I can only assume that, yes, absolutely, there were, you know, famous actors, because I think it, the the mindset is the same in the ancient world, right? You see someone on stage playing this role and you're captivated, you know, it. It's totally natural, especially in theater. Like, if you go to a play now, <laughs> not now, you know, when the world is normal. If you go to a play and you see someone on stage, you, you're you taken with them in this really unique kind of way. I think it's a little bit different even from movies and TV, but like live theater, like there's just something about that. So I'm sure it was the same back then. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, relating back, has a few storylines surrounding like, famous actors, or rather just, just generally actors too. It's really quite interesting. But a great example of this is the word thespian. The word thespian, meaning kind of like, you know, a stage actor, we use it mostly when it comes to Shakespeare in that time frame. But thespian comes from an ancient Greek actor named Thespis. Isn't that cool? So as much as I don't know the direct answer to like just how famous these people were or what kind of worship happened around them, there absolutely were famous actors simply proven by the point of the word thespian comes from an ancient Greek guy's name. So, and I, you know, we have a lot of like statues and things of actors or, or fragments rather, or playwrights, all of that. There was most certainly people who were who were famous and then I can only imagine that you know if this famous actor is big in Athens at a given time then also the play that casts him is going to be big as well now what I did learn from my conversation with Amy Pistone a while back was also that the choruses were sort of everyday people which I find to be particularly interesting it doesn't really lend itself to this question but I just a reminder because I thought that was really fascinating to hear but the actors themselves, you know, there were three in each play, you know, throughout the uh, majority of sort of the height of Greek theater as we see it. Three actors per play. So there weren't probably a ton of famous actors because there were three main plays, or rather, I suppose there were nine plays put on by three different um, tragedians every year at particularly this great Dionysia. Like there were probably others and certainly elsewhere and everything. But the, the biggest performance, you know, uh, celebration that they had was the great Dionysia 
where three different playwrights would put on three different plays, trilogies or otherwise, and then be judged on them. So there's not a ton of plays happening all of the time with there only being three actors within it and things like that. But yeah, I imagine there would have been very famous actors and certainly a certain level of celebrity that was then attached to them because I think that's human nature. You know, I think it's totally natural if you're going to put somebody on stage and have a huge crowd of people watching them perform this role, there is going to be celebrity that naturally becomes attached to that. People are going to idolize, people are going to, you know, develop ideas in their own head, put these things onto this person. All of those things are just completely natural and fascinating human nature for sure. And more on to history and famous people. There's another question from Theo, and I apologize for leaving other people's questions out uh, and answering two from one person, but I have to with this one because (laughs) it's about Cicero. They say, I'm a very big fan of Skyrim, and he appears as the most annoying companion you can have in the game. And I just wanted to know if the real Cicero was just as obnoxious or if that was the devs being kind of... being weird, kind of specific questions. Sorry. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Okay. Cicero is super fucking annoying, for sure. Like Cicero, so Cicero, for those who don't know, um, was an ancient Roman orator. He was like a speech maker. He was in politics in some way. Do I know enough about Roman history? Absolutely not. Did I have to read Cicero in translation in university? Yes, I did. Cicero was obnoxious. It's like a running joke on Classics Twitter, too, about like just how annoying. He wrote all these speeches and He's a good example of like how much Roman text we have that survives because we have like all of this guy's speeches and they were just, I don't know if he physically, you know, spoke them out and then wrote them down or what have you, but Lord, there's a lot. He's wordy. He's annoying. He lived during the, you know, the kind of height of, I think, Roman obnoxiousness. Uh, As far as I know, it was just towards the end of the Republic. Like, I feel like he was somehow in the room or around when Caesar was killed. Like he comes from that time frame. And he just generally, yeah, like from what we have of him, I think he would have been like an extremely annoying and ridiculous person to be around, like just deeply frustrating and over the top. And to close it off, some more questions about translations, because I think translations are super important and interesting. And I think, well, it's certainly a question I get asked in DMs and stuff all the time. I I don't ever have time to answer all of those ones just because they happen too much and I'm saying the same thing. But I do have FAQs listed for all of you, both on my website and my Instagram highlights that suggest certain translations if you're ever needing to look back, because it's a common question. It's an important one, but it's just one I get asked too often. But translations. Okay, so specifically, this question was from Rocket, who says, there seems to be a debate going on in the classical literature slash mythology world around translations. Should the translator stick to the direct translation or use some artistic license in the translation to make the wording more lyrical or modern? What's your opinion? So I have a lot of opinions on this, and I think that both of those options have validity. So for instance, one of my favorite translators of Greek text is Anne Carson, who absolutely falls into the latter option. There's a lot of really interesting language, really modern language that I think really adds something to the play. But I also also think it's important that, you know, if you want a broader understanding of the Greek plays, if you want to fully appreciate them in their ancient form, you need to just have both, right? Like you need to have a more literal translation and you need to have like a more showy, really accessible, really readable translation, which I find most of Anne Carson's to be. I'm thinking particularly of Bacchae. The Her translation of Bacchae is beautiful and so interesting and weird and unique and readable. It's very readable because she modernizes the language a lot. And modernizing the language is not necessarily making it not true to the original text, right? Because it's not like the ancient Greeks spoke in old-timey English, right? Like, we often connect that idea of sort of stilted old English to ancient languages, but that's only because that's how they were first translated into English, not actually because the ancient Greeks used some kind of formal speech that doesn't resemble how we speak now, right? Like it was just a different language, like anything. So it's it's important, I think, to think in that respect as well, where having it be like 
old and stuffy sounding does not make it more accurate. It just makes it an older, stuffier translation. Now, you know, that doesn't apply to everything. Like, Ann Carson's, for instance, also, like, shortens things and really makes them very casual in a way that I don't think is necessarily, you know, deeply accurate to the text. That said, she's a very good translator. So I'm sure it's accurate translations. It's just choices being made within those translations. But it's just an interesting question, right? I think we have this mindset, but about the language, but it's more based in the fact that it used to be that, you know, super old stuffy white men were translating it. And that's what we have. So we think that's more accurate, but that's not really true. That said, translation generally matters. So you can have more literal translations or the like the fancier ones. But ultimately, you know, as long as you're getting the point across, it doesn't really matter. I also think it matters what you're thinking of. Like plays are a little different, say, from, you know, uh, I'm going to be reading a lot of Plato in translation in the next one. And obviously that's very different. There's different things you can do because plays were very... um you know, plays were a creative endeavor. They were, they're like movies and things, right? And so there's a lot that can be done and shifted and it that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. It's just, it, the translation is another new creative endeavor. It's, it's a fascinating thing to really think about. That said, I think there are certain translations that are, you know, uh, not more valid, but I think more accessible today. And also there are certain things that are important in a translation, uh, which leads me to the next question from Nora, who says, I've had the factoid that men translated the word for woman as whore in the Odyssey, I think it is, in my head for ages now. So I need to ask, what are your recommendations for modern translations by women? Translations of any ancient text, honestly, I'm so hungry for this point of view. And I am happy to give it to you. First, the anecdotes you're thinking of definitely are in relation to the Odyssey. They came out a lot when Emily Wilson's translation was coming about. People were talking about it a lot, and I think she talked about it a lot. So there are definitely older translations by old stuffy white men who translated variations on the word for woman as whore. They did it a lot for the, um, the servant women, the enslaved women in the Odyssey. And what they've done, or what they did rather, is that those words were often used because there was like a negative context to the woman in the passage, but it it went from like, she's a bad woman to she's a whore, or she's a bad woman who slept with a suitor to she's a whore. And like, obviously, these are very different ideas, right? Like, the, one is deeply derogatory towards the woman, and the other is like a truthful thing that happened. Right. It's completely different to say that she did some bad things and also she slept with a suitor. Like that suggests that, yes, yeah, she did some bad things. Whether or not sleeping with a suitor is one of those bad things is, rele- is irrelevant. But it, switching that to whore <laughs> has a lot of meaning. And then it gets, you know, it, it just completely changes the way you're thinking about it. Meanwhile, these women in question are enslaved. They have no choice in the matter. Everything is happening to them. They don't have any agency. So there's no reason in hell why they should be called whores. It's it's a fascinating thing. There's a lot of articles about it. If you guys want to Google, you know, even just... It, it was really all around when Emily Wilson was translating the Odyssey for some reference points. Which leads me to, if you want to read a translation of the Odyssey, you should definitely read Emily Wilson's. So my biggest recommendation is Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey. She's also working on the Iliad. So can't wait for that one to come out. But there's also a translation of the Iliad by Caroline Alexander. I have not read it. I didn't get it until after I'd covered the Iliad episodes. Um, but I have it. I've heard very good things. And whenever I get around to reading the Iliad for fun, I will be reading that translation for sure. She's written a lot of really interesting things. I have a couple of her books that I've been meaning to read forever. So I think, you know, I think that's a good a good example for sure. There is a new translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses coming out later this year, I believe, hopefully very soon, uh, by Stephanie McCarter. I cannot wait for this. I've been following her on Twitter. I, I'm so looking forward to this translation. I will absolutely be posting about it when I get it. And uh, I wish I could read from it. Obviously, I can't. It's copyright. But I will highly recommend it and probably share a couple like maybe choice quotes because I think it's going to be really big. Um, it, yeah, it's super fascinating to hear of a, a new translation of Metamorphoses of all things, which I love so much and, and done by a woman. So great. When it comes to Greek plays, as I've already said a lot, I, I do highly recommend the Ann Carson translations. They are super unique, um, but they're beautiful and really, really well done. 
As for others, I mean, I would say you don't need to stick necessarily to translations by women in order to avoid the issues like translating the word into whore. Um, Because ultimately, a lot of that is just the age of a lot of accessible translations, unfortunately. So I would say the the priority would just be to look for newer translations. I mean, if you're interested, dig into the translator too, because they could be, you know, particularly problematic. There's definitely a lot of problematic people working in classics. But overall, I would say newer translations are just going to be accessible and a, a little bit more they're just going to be more aware of things like that and and not making those same mistakes. It doesn't mean specific to women translators. There's a lot of women who have also made shitty translations or problematic ones, you know? So I think it's more of a matter of the way the world is evolving and changing and the way that newer translations reflect that. So I always try to get new translations whenever I can. Obviously, I'm in a specific situation where I'm able to. I'm very grateful for that. But in terms of like, if you're aching for a particular book, I would just look for a newer translation. Uh, Unfortunately, that often means you have to pay more. So it's kind of, you know, that's just the way it ends up, unfortunately, because the more, the less expensive translations tend to be older ones. That's how they end up less expensive. But overall, there's a lot of really great translations coming out these days. I'm always getting new ones. I'm always excited for them. I try to read multiple translations for everything in order to get a real sense of it. So, you know, for instance, the last time I covered a play, Prometheus Bound, I think we, because I have a researcher helping me, and I think between us we were working off of, it was at least three, it might have been four translations where, you know, just getting the sense of all the different variations, tone and meaning. And it really does vary so much that it's really fascinating to be reading a lot of translations if you can, right? I mean, obviously, it's all about if you can. If you just want to read something for fun, if you want to stick to the epics, pick up Emily Wilson's Odyssey, pick up Caroline Alexander's Iliad. You're really going to enjoy them. Um, Oh, there's a new one of the Aeneid by, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce his name right, so I apologize in advance, but Shadi Barch. It's S-H-A-D-I-B-A-R-T-S-C-H. And I, I haven't read that one. I think it came out after I covered the the Aeneid, but I, I've heard good things about that one as well. So, you know, there's a lot of great examples. When it comes to the plays, I would say just find, pick up a copy, like go to a bookstore if you can, right? <laughs> Pandemic aside, find a newer translation, flip through it. See if you find the language to be accessible to you. See if you enjoy the language that is used in that translation. And then that's going to be a good translation for you, you know? But truly, I really do appreciate all of Ann Carson's. They're really quite interesting. She has, um, particularly the back eye is amazing. And then there is uh, her version of Oristia, which is actually the three play or it is three plays, but each one is done by a different of the three tragedians since they've each covered the story of, of the Oristia and the whole epic saga of the house of Atreus. So in that case, it's quite interesting. I'm not sure which is which, but it, it's interesting way of covering it where you're getting all three of the playwrights in one edition by one translator. It's quite beautiful. And I'm going to finish off this wonderful question and answer period with a generic question that has been asked in many ways by many of you in this little call out I put, which is the question of whether I'm going to cover other mythologies at any given time, or generally the question of mini myths when it comes to other mythologies. So I thought I'd answer it all kind of in one. When it comes to the question of mini myths, a little peek behind the curtain and complete honesty for why I don't do mini myths anymore. One It's because I now have the time to cover full myths every week because I no longer, you know, this is now my full job, which is incredible. So I love that I don't have to do minis anymore. But two, it's because I'm now beholden to a certain number of ad spots in every episode. And I don't ever want to give you guys any new, I have to do it with the old ones because I can't, it's unavoidable, but any new episodes that are under half an hour and have too many ads. I don't want to do that to you. I I wouldn't like it if I was listening, so I won't be doing episodes under 30 minutes unless I have some weird little bonus thing to add, and then I still try to avoid having too many ads in them if I can get away with it. Um, So that's kind of the answer on mini myths generally. That said, I could still obviously get away with, you know, telling two mini myth styles in one episode, which which I would definitely consider under the right circumstances. When it comes to other mythologies... 
I do want to learn more about Egyptian mythology or have people on to talk about Egyptian mythology because I find Egyptian particularly fascinating. If I have someone who can teach me about Mesopotamian, Persian mythology, Phoenician, I would be so down. Um, so those are things where if somebody is able to come on and uh, do a conversation episode with me about those mythologies, that's how I would want to handle it because I don't have the uh, the reference points, the knowledge, the sourcing information in order to do those mythologies justice. I wouldn't know where to look and I wouldn't do a good job. And so I don't want to do it at all. Uh, but again, if I have experts who want to come on, and handle that and teach me and all of you about those mythologies, I would love it. So I'm always on the lookout. Hopefully we'll have some in the new future. If you are listening and you are an expert in a mythology that is not Greek and Roman, please reach out. I have a form on my website to fill out if you're an expert, an academic, what have you, an author, whatever, um, on my website under the contact page where you can fill out that form and you get put on my list of people who would love to be on the show and then I can reach out. So I'm always open to that because I would love to have more mythology on uh, from the ancient Mediterranean. I would stick to the Mediterranean because that's just my vibe. That's where I, that's the place I know and what I want to learn more about. Um, but I'm always open to, to hearing more about those mythologies when it comes to my own research, unless I learn how to do it well and really do it justice to these mythologies that are historically underrepresented, that's a huge part of it, right? Like they are underrepresented. And so I don't want to come in with my like white girl attitude of just like, let me find the, you know, whatever source Google brings up for me and have no idea about its authority or validity and just start telling you guys stuff. Like I am not about that. I want it to be accurate and truthful to the cultures and their mythologies and all of that. So open to having guests, but that's kind of the answer on other mythologies broadly. I really do try to do my best with this show, particularly now at the beginning, you know, I, the, everything's a growth, particularly podcasts. And so at the beginning, you know, my research skills were minimal. I started this podcast thinking, I don't know, a handful of people would listen. And now my first episode still to this day gets more downloads than any other episode of the podcast. And I just, you know, it was so poorly researched. I'm glad you guys love it. But truly, my research skills now are just so much better. And every once in a while, somebody will contact me about one of those first ones. And I'm just like, guys, like, listen to a later one. I've been doing this for four and a half years. Like I promise I got better. Uh, but I'm really proud of how the research is now and, and where my skills have gotten to. And so that is how I want to stay and just keep getting better and more accurate and more knowledgeable and more open. And I, I hope I'm doing it all to the best. I mean, I'm certainly doing it to the best of my ability. I'm trying very hard, but I hope it comes across. I'm uh, getting really sincere at this ending. I really appreciate all these questions, though. That's why I had to do this extra episode, because for one, another peek behind the curtain is I've been trying to get you guys to ask questions for weeks so I would have enough, and then I had very few. So I put out the call yesterday right before I was going to record, and then I got so many questions and so many good ones. So by the time I was recording, I couldn't even keep track of all of the good ones. I just kind of answered whatever I could yesterday uh, when I was recording the first one. And then I got so many more after I'd recorded and they were so good, so, which is why I'm doing this other episode, which I think is a better, better series of answers on my part. Obviously, all of your questions are all great and wonderful, but I've learned how I want to answer questions before the second episode. So thank you all for listening. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate the way that they make me think out loud and you get to hear these thought processes and realize where it all comes from. And I think it's helpful generally when it comes to building your own knowledge and building your own passions and everything to see, I mean, growth, but also just like how these things exist within my mind, because I think that translates well to every other human. You know, the more you research, the more you learn, the more you listen and pay attention to as many voices and as diverse voices as you can find in your field, the better you're going to get. And I think this is a great example. And your questions bring that out in me, which is why I really, really enjoy them. So thank you all so much.
Well, that was already kind of my outro, but I hadn't put the music in. So thank you all so much again for listening. I really appreciate it. On Tuesday, Atlantis, the first episode of my Atlantis series. I am so excited. Uh, It's going to be really, really different and cool and interesting and weird and dark. And honestly, I think a lot of you are going to be completely shocked with what Atlantis really is, what it's become, everything in between, the experts I've talked to. Oh my God, they're so fascinating. The conversations are great. I learned so much. You will learn so much. It's truly, it, it's really something else. Um, So I cannot wait for you all to hear it. Stay tuned. And thank you again all so much for listening. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.